today is all about you. So for the next hour, whatever you want me to help you with, you just let me know. Yeah. It can be guitar stuff. It can be like setting goals and how you can achieve whatever you're going for in music or anything. But knowing that, you know, you most likely will win September as well. You know, you can just like focus on one thing now and then we'll have another lesson next month because it looks like you're going to win. So, yeah. all right. Uh, so actually, I want to join Berkeley's school or college of music. So how do I get in there with scholarship? So which one is it that you said? Uh, Berkeley College of Music, London. So you want to go to Berkeley College of Music in Boston? Yeah. 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 So basically, Berkeley College of Music, Boston. So um, do you mind letting me know how old you are? Uh, I'm 16, actually. Okay, you're 16. So... We have another person in the community, Simon. You've you've seen him in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he. Yeah, I talked to him. Oh, yeah. Have you messaged him about Berkeley and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I actually was going to make, record a video like this week, um, about like how I got a scholarship to Berkeley and different ways to make money, um, like make money beforehand and then like how to save money while you're at Berkeley. Um, Berkeley has two rules. And they don't tell you these rules, but there's two rules. There's either you're going to be someone who can pay or you're going to be someone who can bring value to the community. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So the scholarship is determined on whether you can pay or mm -hmm. you can bring value. So say they get like influencers who are like amazing musicians who have social presences or who are really, really good musicians and they're touring and they, they have like, they have a brand those people, they get scholarships way faster than other people. Now, the other strategy when it comes to getting a scholarship is Berkeley will do this as a very clever strategy. They'll see someone who's good or who shows promise. And then what they'll do is they'll give them a Parch scholarship, which is what they did with me. And then they used the part scholarship to get me in the door, but then I paid the rest. So I had a 30, I had a one third of my tuition covered. So 30, 33% or whatever it was. So it's 10,000 yeah. US a year. And then, but we had, we still had to pay the other 60%, you know, which is fantastic. The thing for me was I was average. So I wasn't like some special crazy musician when I went, like when I got the scholarship, I was not a crazy musician. The fact is that got me in was that, um, I practiced a lot. I was good at my instrument, but I wasn't incredible. And then the other thing that was a huge factor was I had good grades. I had good grades at my college that I was studying at. And because when I f okay. did the very first audition, uh, when because I, I did three auditions to get into both, like I got in the first time when I auditioned, but I got a scholarship on the third audition. So the first audition I went in, I, um, and I knew I would not get a scholarship. So I went in and I a hundred percent knew I was not going to get a scholarship. Uh, it just so happened that the Dean of admissions was the guy who was touring um, mm -hmm. and doing all the auditions. So they had a, a couple of musicians doing the musical portion of it. And then the Dean did the interview afterwards. So you do like a music portion, then like an, an interview after you do all your music stuff. And I just said flat out, like literally he, the first question, I just said, Hey, so what do I got to do to get a scholarship? I just asked him and he was like, uh, well, like, he was like, why is this guy randomly just asking me this? <laughs> and he was like, well, I think, what, what, how did I frame the, I can't remember the exact way I framed the question, but I was, it was around the lines, like, what does it take to get the scholarship? Because I knew yeah, I wasn't yeah. getting the, the scholarship at all. Mm -hmm. And he was like, look, um, you got to be good at your instrument. And then we got to know you're good as, as a student. Because mm -hmm. it's in full transparency, they could get great musicians any day of the week. Like this, there's thousands of musicians that come through that are that are definitely good enough, but the second that they walk through the door, they Berkeley doesn't make money on musicians getting in. They make money on musicians staying. So you need to finish your degree. So the realistic approach of like, okay, well, if it's US dollars, we're looking at something like 150,000 US dollars to get through Berkeley minimum. And so they're like, we need someone who can pay that. 
And so they need to make sure like if, as a business model, that's how it works. So when they're picking out the people, they are very, very conscious of who they're going to get. They know that, oh, they're not like, oh, you're so passionate about music. They're like, yeah, but if this person signs up and even though they're really good, they might not want to stay the long time. Like they don't want dropouts. Dropouts are not good unless they become John Mayer. But the chances of the dropout becoming John Mayer is like 0%, zero, like 1% maybe, you know? And that's, okay. so taking that frame when it comes to Berkeley is definitely going to help you. So knowing what they are looking for is going to be great. Now, I will pull this up really fast. I, I, it came up as a memory on my Facebook the other day. I'll see if I can find this. But it's the exact wording that this will help you the most, I reckon, when it comes to like how Berkeley sees stuff. Um, let me see. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm looking at my Facebook page. Let's see if I can find this. I wonder if I can. Is there a way to go to year? I think it's 2019. No, no, not 2019. It was 2014. I got accepted. Posted by me. Let's have a look. Was it 2019? 2014. Boom. All right, here we go. So I just found my acceptance letter to Berkeley, right? So this might help you. So let me zoom in on this so I can explain it. There's a key words here. Congratulations. We are delighted to inform you. You have been selected to receive $10,000 in scholarship to attend Berkeley as a full-time undergraduate student. This is, this recognition is indeed an honor and a privilege considering the high level of talent. So that was the first thing. It said high level of talent and musical promise. This is the most important thing. Musical promise. We have observed during your audition and interview promise. Like they could say high level of talent. They say it to everyone. But when they say musical promise, you always got to remember, they're not looking for someone who is already the best they're looking for someone who can be shaped and can do good stuff and who will actually take the time to learn and be a good student. So that's something that like just in the wording of the email, they're like, you got to have a high level of skill and you also have to show musical promise. That's all they care about because they, they don't care if you're like, a virtuoso because you could work walk in as a virtuoso come and do a semester and then you're a useless student and then they're like well they they literally have a cutoff you have to s sustain your grades to get this keep the scholarship so you get the scholarship for one year every year you have to re renew it you have to go sh through a year renewal process for your scholarship so you got to make sure you have high grades so that those are the two things that they're looking for and then looking at the frame of how they run their business that's how you got to look at it so if you're 16, you want to get it good. The first thing that you need to do is you need to learn what hard feels like, which is practicing every single day and not in the sense of just playing it. Like the fact that you're in our community, you're going to like absolutely destroy if you just do everything I tell you, because I'm just going to tell you, you don't have to waste the hundreds of hours that I did because <laughs> I, I was guessing the whole time I was doing it. I was guessing what they wanted. I was guessing what was going to work. I was guessing what the teachers were, were helping me with or like which was the best practice method because every guitar teacher was telling me a different thing. They were like, oh, do this or do this or learn these scales. And like everything was fighting it. But the, 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 the three things you'll need to prove, um, one is like, can you play your instrument? Two, do you have like a set, of, like do you have charisma and do you, do you, look like a good student would do you look like someone that they would want to bring in like that's a huge thing like that is totally a factor when it comes in to the audition and then after that they're going to leave you like once you're in they're like sweet we got you hooks in talon you start paying now the thing that i'm concerned about students when they go to berkeley is as soon as you go to berkeley especially internationally where which country are you from i'm from india india Okay, well, yeah. can your parents afford $150,000 US? 
for you to go to music. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They would yeah. they would be totally comfortable doing that. Yes. Yeah. So I would sit down with your parents. First thing I would ask is like, I want to go to Berkeley and this is how much it costs. Calculate the entire cost of whatever that is for Berkeley and then add another $50,000 a year or yeah, probably around that. I would say maybe $35,000 a year for living. Oh, so, okay. so you've got like, you got the, the tuition, which is like 150 grand or whatever it is. These are rough estimations. I don't know what it is exactly, but I'm just giving you a rough idea. 150,000 mm -hmm. US, and then you've got 35,000 plus a year. I mean, you could try and bring that down. Like I think the lowest I could get it down for myself was maybe like 25,000 a year or less than that. Yeah, just under. But that was like me, we were living off campus. I had just a, uh, we had a room, we managed to split a room and we, and the rent prices were cheap. They kept going up. They must be very expensive by now. Um, so like I made it work and I, I ate like, I ate like the worst and it was, <laughs> it was really bad. But yeah, you're gonna think like 25,000 a year to 35,000 a year to live because you got you got to live and right. so and the whole time you're there you can't work so you can't earn or generate any money if you're international oh. mm -hmm. so you're literally in a in a in a in a in a money perspective you're making no money and you're and you are costing money so as long as your parents are fine with hey for four years i'm going to literally lose you all the money like and it's going to cost you up to like maybe 200 250,000 dollars US. I don't know what that is in um in Indian currency, but it is very expensive. It is a huge amount. But yeah, yeah. If you are driven, you could crush it. Now, that is the bare minimum if you like speak to your parents and they're like we're down, we want to see you achieve your dreams, let's go. Um I can make this happen. You can do that. Now, what I recommended to Simon was if that's the bare minimum of what you can do, then every student that I recommend going to Berkeley is don't do that. Because there's a level of preparation that you can do before going to Berkeley where you can crush. So you should pretty much set aside, does uh, Berkeley do tours in India for auditions or how do they do it? Do you know what they what Yeah, they do? Um, I, I I think there is an online audition, like they take online. They do it online? Okay, what yeah. I would do is as soon as you're allowed to, start auditioning for Berkeley. And I would do every audition that you could do, as long as, the, I don't know if they make they charge you for it, but um, I would do every audition you could do to practice the audition. And I would not, Except I would not even think about going until there was a scholarship on the plate of at least 30%. If, if, as long as you were getting at least 30% of your tuition, because that's what I got, that's what you should aim for. And then while you do that, you could go to a, like a cheap community college or something like that and start collecting credits. Because when you go to Berkeley to do the undergrad, you have to do a bunch of really, really annoying subjects like english and history and art and stuff like that because they try to create the uh holistic experiences like an undergrad you, that's what your degree is you need to be like worldly in knowledge it's so dumb we're here to get good at music but they have us like learning art history it's like i get that there's some merit to it but it's just like stupid but you can go and you can study those at a, at a, at a accredited university for like a fraction of the price and then you can transfer them as credits and now you don't have to pay because Berkeley charges you premium on even those dumb subjects. So you, you'd you be doing advanced lyric writing one with Pat Patterson is gonna cost the same amount as art history with some like random person. Like, like it's like apples and oranges of value. Like they're just so dumb, like that, how they do that. So that's one thing to, to think about. You can go and do college credits and then you can transfer them in. Um, and like when you're at Berkeley, there's another way you can save money. Once you get into Berkeley, you can study subjects before you go, like before, like each semester. And you can be like, all right, I'm about to do conducting. 
there's two levels of conducting, conducting one and conducting two. I will study conducting one and I'll go to the office hours of the conducting teacher. I will learn a little bit about conducting one. At the start of the next semester, I will test out of conducting one because I will go in, you sit in the office hour and they're like, all right, we're gonna do conducting test out. And then you do your conducting and they're like, yeah, you pass, you can go straight to conducting two. Bam, you've now saved $3,000 US because now you don't have to do conducting one, you just go straight into conducting two. But the problem with that is it will condense these things that I'm telling you, they might save you money, but they're also going to condense the duration of your degree. So my four year degree became three years. And the way I extended it, I left one or two subjects available in my last semester. So I did two part-time semesters at the end. Oh no, I did one part-time semester. And it was, um, I left Harmony 4 and I left some like songwriting fun, it was a really fun subject. I was like, I want my last semester to be awesome at Berkeley. So I took two subjects and I just had the best time. I just played World of Warcraft and I, and I did those subjects and that's all I did, <laughs> which is not what I recommend, but you can study the subjects, test out of them, save money and move forward. And that is like how you can save money at Berkeley when you have a scholarship. So now you've got a scholarship get, saving you 10 grand a, a year, and then you're testing out of these subjects. Say you test out of like one or two subjects a year. If you can do two subjects a year, that's an extra six grand a year that you're saving. And then if you come in with already credits, that might be like three or four courses that you now don't have to take, which is another 10 or 12 grand. So you can see how these are starting to make it more realistic on how you can save money and go to Berkeley. Is that, is that making uh, sense? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I wasn't sure. Cause like, this is like high level strategy of like, let's, let's save money. And then, um, the biggest proponent outside of that is you yeah. need to learn how to make money as a musician. So this is the thing. How do we do that? Yeah. So uh, I actually, what was that? Sorry. Uh, how do we make money as a musician? So I, I just posted, um, on the feedback Friday, you asked that question, right? In the school community. Yeah. So on the feedback Friday, I, I, I answered it. So I did like a, yeah. like a 20, like a 15, 20 minute rant. I'm going to post that video today for you. So it's the stage of how you go from $0 to then going up to potentially a hundred thousand dollars a year it, where you can earn as a musician. So it's going from like building the skills to teach, building the skills to play, building the skills to gig, and then building the skills to build a business out of your gigging and teaching where you take more money and you can basically succeed. So if you take your time and be like, I want to go to Berkeley by the time I'm 22, 23, maybe, or even 25, you could work really, 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 really hard on building your craft and being really good at music. Because this is the thing about Berkeley. Berkeley is not about you learning how to get good at music. All the education from Berkeley, like if you want to get good at, at music, just join my school. You're in my school. I'm going to upload every single thing I know about music. And most of, honest to God, most of the stuff I'm going to give you is actually better than what you would learn at Berkeley because Berkeley is going to set you up on metrics that allow, allow you to get graded. So they're going to make you do like, you need to learn all your arpeggio shapes and then you'll do a test and you'll play all your arpeggio shapes. That doesn't have anything to do with music and it's not going to make you good and not, oh, sorry, my phone is going off and making annoying noises. That's not going to make you good at music, but that's going to allow them to objectively tick off like, oh, he can play, you know, C major triad in four positions, boom, boom, boom. Like, cool. Like they give you an A or a B or whatever they give you. So that's what Berkeley does. And a lot of the music stuff you'll have to learn there, like, tonal harmony and conducting and like all the, like none of that shit, that stuff is not useful. Like if you're trying to be like, I want to be a great guitarist. I want to write, write songs. I want to perform. I want to do that stuff. Like you're not going to, why do I need to know conducting man? <laughs> like I'm not going to conduct my band when we go and play gigs. Like that's, you know, so like that it's designed. The Berkeley degree is designed to give you the blueprints for many career paths. It's not designed to like specialize. So the, the reason why I'm going on this tangent is that if you can acquire skills and build the skills as a musician, you can go to Berkeley for the real reason you want to go to Berkeley, which is you want to walk in ready. You want to walk in like, I already can play the crap out of guitar. 
I can already sing. I can write songs. I know how to, I can record music. I have an understanding of theory. You know, you want to walk in and you want all the musicians that are uncomfortable with music to think you're a rock star. And then, but you're not trying to convince them that you're good. You want to be already like, I already know how to practice six hours a day. I already know how to practice eight hours a day. You want to walk in with that level of skill towards the, like your craft that when you do meet people that match it, because that's what Berkeley's about. You're going to meet a lot of people that are actually insanely good and they will do great things. The amount of my peers that have gone on to do great things in music, even just my roommate, like straight up both my roommates are absolutely crushing it right now. One of them, so they work together. They had like a duo thing um, where they were writing songs as a pop group. He got picked up by the Chainsmokers as their piano player. And now he's built an entire career as a solo neoclassic player. And he's writing songs and composing and he's absolutely crushing, doing world tours. And my other roommate is his manager, essentially. So like he helps and manage do everything, like absolutely crushes the business side. So it's like that partnership happened because of Berkeley. So, and, and that's just one story. There are many stories of like a lot of people that I know that are now writing hit songs with like, you know, the biggest artists in the world. You can look at their, their credits. They are on the top 100 on billboard right now, crushing it. And so it's like, when you go to Berkeley, you want to be in that circle. You want to be in the circle of the people, not to be like, Hey, get like, let's, I want to get something out of you. No, you just want to be the someone you can give value to. You want to be the guy that you can play music, you know how to do things. And most importantly, you have money. Because if you can learn how to make money from the time you're like 18 to 25 in music, and you can save up like $100,000, because I will give you the framework to get to 100k a year. Like if you can save $100,000, because you're young, you don't have kids, you don't have like huge rent things, you know, if you're living with your parents and things like that, you could save an insane amount of money. And you could go there with, you know, the best audio equipment, the best guitar, you could have your own apartment that you stay in, you know, you can afford the like the luxuries that the other students can't, because you already did the hard yards early. So then when you go to Berkeley, those people want to hang out with you, they will want to come to your apartment, that you have like that one room, and you've got like, a whole studio set up and mic set up and everything. And when you're doing like a songwriting class, you guys will just record the demo there. All these people will want to be around you and you can create that ecosystem where these people want to work with you. And that, that is going to set you up so that while you're at Berkeley, you're building these connections, you're going to all the master classes, you're learning all from the best, mu like literally touring best artists in the world, like John Mayer will be there. Brad Paisley went there, like, oh, like so many of these great people that you'll get to meet and learn from. You don't want to pitch to them. You just want to listen to their stories so you can build the frameworks and the blueprints on how you can crush. Once you finish Berkeley, you get one year. When you graduate Berkeley, they give you one year work visa. So during the whole three years, you need to build a portfolio and then you actually get to work in music. You get like this really easy visa to work in. And that gives you another year to really like go hard. So you can move to LA, you can move to Nashville and really like go super hard and do that. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of people when they get on that one year, they've never worked before. So if you've already accumulated five years of experience gigging, like booking shows, learning how to make money, learning how to teach, by the time you get to that point, you'll be absolutely crushing it. And you'll be like, hell yeah, let's, let's go. And then you can get the work visa to stay in the U S to then build whatever career you want in music. Okay. But that's, that's essentially the playbook. The, the, the God tier playbook for Berkeley is work really hard. Audition as many times as you can until you can get a scholarship. Make sure you have all your test out stuff ready and make sure if you can acquire credits from university, get them so that you can like transfer them over. So go do, the easiest, the cheapest college degree you can get, like the worst, like community college, go there. <laughs> like at Berkeley, we call it like in America, they call it community college. It's like the cheapest college you can go to. That's where I went to when I went to Berkeley, I went to Berkeley and I would go to 
this community college down like on the other side of Boston. And I did three courses there and that saved me nearly 10 grand or 12 grand. So it's like that, that's what I did. <laughs> I didn't want to take those classes at Berkeley. I, I just saved the money and did them at a different place. So that's what you can do. That's all the ninja stuff. And then if you can, during that whole period of you cultivating your skills get, skill set to get the scholarship, you're also learning how to make money in music, then bro, you save that money, you go to Berkeley, you crush. You could even, to that point, like if you crush it that hard, by the time you're 25, you could just pay for Berkeley. You don't even have to ask your parents. Like there could be a scenario where you just save enough money. If you can get to a place where you're doing like 50 to 100K a year, and you only like live on like 10,000 or 20,000, like you just live a super, super like basic life and just don't buy anything and don't do anything. And all you do is music and you make money in music. You could just go pay for it yourself. <laughs> and that would be pretty baller. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So does that, does that give you a good, good like roadmap of like what you can do over the next seven to eight years? Yeah, because seven to eight years for your life is like half of your life. Mm -hmm. So when you think of like in seven to eight years in, in your life, you're like, man, that's half my life. And I have to do that. That's how long it takes. But seven to eight years is actually nothing. A lot of people want things really, really fast. So they try to like, how can I get it all happen? Like you're going to be you'll be wanting it to happen by the time you're 18. Or by the time you can go to Berkeley. And like you can like literally just walk through the door. You'll be like, I want it fast. I want to do it. And I'm saying, if you just wait and do it nice and slow, aim for the marathon, not the sprint, you will get so much out of it. Like you will be so far ahead. You will be literally, you'll be, you'll actually be 10 years ahead of me. Like me. And I've worked very, very hard and I've optimized a lot of stuff but you will easily be 10 years ahead of me. And so it's like, uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, so what skill do you need to be a professional guitarist? What skills are required? For being a professional guitarist? Yeah. You need to be able to play in time and you need to know a lot of songs. Yeah. That's it. Like that's okay. The like, I, honest to God, like it's as simple as that. If you can play in time and you know a lot of songs, and when I say a lot of songs, like if you want to go and play with people uh, immediately, you need to figure out the venues that you can play at. And then you need to try and meet as many. Like, if do you know of anyone who is currently performing and gigging as a musician? Uh, no. No. So I, would, I know Lee Brad. What was that? Brad from our community, Brad. Oh, you're someone in your community band or something like that. Yeah. What I would do is wherever in your town, like that you were in your city or anything like that, have a look if there's venues like restaurants, bars, anything like that, or like markets or things like that, that any way you can find live music, go and look, ask people like, Hey, have you ever heard of a band playing at a restaurant or have you heard someone doing this? Try and find the places or even look online in your town, like live music, Google, live music, wherever, live music, and then find anyone that's there. Follow those musicians on Instagram. Reach out to them and say, hey, I'm 16, I play guitar, I'm, I really wanna do this like as in my future, I can't wait, I'm, gonna, I'm working as hard as I can. Do you mind if I like come to your shows and I ask you questions and things like that? You will go to their shows and then you're gonna write down every single song that they play. And you're gonna mm -hmm. ask them for their set lists. If you're 16 and hungry, people like that are just like, they want to, a lot of the times, if anyone's like any, any decent, they want to be the person like, yeah, I helped that guy. Yeah. yeah. He did that because of me. You, like they think that and like play on that human psychology and learn every single song that they know. I mean, I will give you all the songs that I know and I'm, I can, I don't know how it works in your town because each, each country, each town is going to have its like, go-to songs that like work really, really well. But um, like, so in Australia, Brown Eyed Girl, awesome. Summer of 69, awesome. But then we have like Australian context songs, like the song called Horses and 
We have songs like um, Never Tear Us Apart and things like these are all songs that are like niche to Australia, but not the world. So you would go and learn those songs and you would just play them in time and you just learn heaps of pop songs. Like that is, if you want to get paid, that's all you need to do. You don't need to be out like playing guitar solos is under, it's like the most overrated thing. In fact, people hate guitarists that play solos. That's the most annoying thing in the world. So the first uh, thing that you would do, like, if you're like, hey, I immediately want to start acquiring skills to be a, a hireable musician. Well, then the first thing you want to do is look at every single song that I'm performing live on and just start playing them. Like my song list is up there. Go through every single one of those songs and just learn how to play the rhythm parts of every single one. If you can play those rhythm parts of every single one of those songs between the country genre, pop genre, blues genre, all those things, if you can play great rhythm on every single one of them, you will be hireable. Uh, then after memorizing the fretboard, like after memorizing the guitar fretboard, uh, like all the note names of the all the note names. Uh, so, what is the next step I should take in uh, to improvise? I can't improvise because I've never memorized the fretboard. You shouldn't memorize. The I've never fretboard. memorized the fretboard. It's a waste of time. Why? Uh, like, so how the, to get better at improvising? So, the, to get better at improvising, you got to play. And that's as and as that's a very broad statement. So I will go into the the niches of it. A lot of people, when they go into improvisation, they're thinking, "What are the scales I need to learn? What are the notes I need to learn? What's arpeggios? Things like that." That's actually the least important thing that you need to know. And a lot of people over-index, like they just do put so much time into that that it means that they don't acquire the actual skill of being able to play music. So it truly just comes down to playing the songs. So like when mm -hmm. I told you go through my song list and learn the rhythms of everything, the reason I'm saying that is because that means whether you want to learn how to improvise, sing and play, do anything like re remotely with a band, you will have the skills to then sound musical because you're actually connecting to the, one of the most important parts of the song, which is the groove of the song. Now, yeah. when you go to play the guitar, uh, let me just quickly turn this on. It's like, I always forget to turn this pedal on whenever I get into the studio right away. It will have a button. So your goal is you want to start, pick the song. Don't go like your guitar practice when it comes to improvisation should never ever be, I'm going to practice my scales. I'm going to do my exercises. I'm going to do my arpeggios. It should never ever be that. Never practice a scale. If there's one thing that if you're like, if you trust what I give and the information that I give and you think that I do give you the practical advice, then the only thing you should do if you follow what I'm showing you is never practice a scale or exercise ever in your life, ever again. From this point forward, you play music. And then you use music to build up the skills and build up the understanding of the scales. So let me show you. All right, I got my guitar. All right, we can hear my guitar now. I got a guitar pick. Is that coming through? Whoa. Why is that so out of tune? <laughs> oh, I know what's wrong. Uh, so I played this wedding and I let the, I let one of the groomsmen play my guitar. So that would be why this guitar sounds wonky. Now, does my, let me fix this, okay. Is my guitar coming through nice and clear now? Yeah. So what you're gonna do is I will go, so say I'm going to do like a G minor pentatonic thing. Now, I say don't practice scales, but you should definitely learn them. So you should sit down and like, you see my improvisation videos, be like, okay, well, if I'm going to play G minor pentatonic, this is how it goes. All right, sweet. Now, say the song is like a... So that's my groove, right? Yeah. And I've got... Uh, 
That's my group. Um, and all I'm going to do is lock into the groove and then I'm going to start just playing through the scale. So we go. I'm just sitting on that pentaton. That's the very basic way you're going to do it. Then you're going to start experimenting with tension and resolution. All I'm tr trying to do with improvisation and as you're building up the skill is your goal with improvising is to replace the vocal. Truly. If someone's doing a guitar solo in a song, there's going to be singing and then your guitar's playing. If you're trying to do imp instrumental music, you are the, the melody. You are leading the melody. You are the actual singer. So you need to be even more strict on the melodies that you're playing. So when you're improvising, you need to be super, 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 super locked in on that. And so it's like, and, it, and when you think that you've got it, you still probably haven't got it. So don't like, don't be like, oh, I did it like a, a day or two and it's starting to get better, wicked. No, it's like, this takes months and years to start building up that, the, the accessibility to that, like really locking in all the time. And what you're going to do is through iteration consistently, you're going to start to build up a bank of licks that are musical. And that is when like you do that for a year and you come back, that's when you start doing like dangerous stuff. And that's when, if you've got that framework down of like, I am jumping in from a musical perspective, I am going to create tension resolution. So that could be like soft and then loud. Or I'm going to do fast and then slow, you know, things like that. Or you like, it's like a normal boom. I do like a, something like that. You know, I'm, I'm mucking around with it and I'm, and I'm using like rhythm. I'm using dynamics and volume. I'm using like the way I attack, I'm using like embellishments of slides, things like that, bends, that's what matters. And then the next step will be like, okay, well, the first chord's a G minor, and then the next chord I'm playing is a C minor, and then I'm playing a D7. Now, when I'm playing over, this is the stage two. So the first stage is like learning how to groove. As soon as you can connect to the groove of the song, you're improvising over that scale. You're not practicing the scale, you know where the notes are, where like no matter what, if you play them, it will sound correct. And you're using groove to be the thing that drives everything that you do in the song. Now, the next stage of improvisation is going to come down to uh, how well can you connect to the chord progression that's happening there. And that's where you're gonna go, you're just gonna dive a little deeper. So you're not gonna practice any arpeggios or blah, blah, blah or scales, you're just gonna go, okay, well, I'm playing a G minor chord right now. So that's a G minor seven. So now what are the notes of the G minor seven that fit over the pentatonic scale that I'm playing? So it'd be this one, that's the root, that's flat three, and we got five, and then I got flat seven, root, flat three, we got five, flat seven, root. So one, flat seven, five, uh, flat three, one, um, flat seven, five, flat three, one. Now I'm going to show you this in my music theory course. I'm going to be adding this very soon, which is going to be like practical chord theory for guitar players. But that's what I would do. So for any time I play a G minor chord, I know that I can play these chord, these notes and it'll sound banger. Can you see, cause those are all the chord tones of the G minor, but I'm still playing in the same minor pentatonic. Now, when I hit C, it opens up a couple of extra notes. This one, and then this one. And then when I hit the D7, this isn't actually in the pentatonic, but this note here is. And then this one's not part of the pentatonic, which is the third. Can you hear me still? Any room? Oh no, did I lose any room? Hmm. 
No. We've lost Aniru. All right, Aniru. I'm still recording this video. Oh, wait, no. He's joining again. Let's go. Whoa, we back. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, the call got cut. I'm so sorry. No, no, that's cool. You good? Okay, cool. So yeah. did you did you get up to the part where we're doing the chord tones? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're on stage two chord tones. So first one, G minor. So I know where that I personally will take the time to figure out where are all the chord tones of G minor. So I've got bum, 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 bum. So that's where you can do arpeggios. That's your, that's technically you learning arpeggios because those are the, all the notes. Arpeggios are you just like accenting the skeleton of the, of whatever chord you're playing. So you've got that. Now, anytime I play a G minor chord, I know that these notes are going to be bangers. And then when I, uh, hit, like, and then when how I hit, do you know what, yeah. Uh, uh, like, how do you know what notes are in G chord or what notes are in G7? So I'm going to show you that stuff. But like, for instance, here, I know that that's a root. And then that's, so did, have you gone through our practical theory music course yet? Yeah. So, you know, in the practical uh, theory course, how I talk about arpeggios, how they're built up of like triads. How they build triads. I know a little bit of um, uh, theory, music theory. I know a little bit. I don't, I don't know too much. Just so, like, so like how, how are major chords made? One, so, three, five. Yeah, cool. One, three, five. Perfect. So if you know one, three, five, then you'll be able to learn, especially if you know the major scale, um, a minor chord is one flat three, five. Do you remember that? Yeah. In the, in the Perfect. Yeah. So I'm so proud of you. I love that you watched that video. Um, so a minor chord is one, one flat three, five. And then a minor yeah. seven chord is adding another triad, which is the seven. But in a minor minor chord, minor seven chord is one flat three five flat seven, and then it goes back to root. So that is now. If we look at a major scale, you know how we're doing the major scale before. Um, I think in that video I show you the major scale shape. It goes like this, like one two three four five six seven one, right? So all you would do is when you play a one, and then when you go to the three. A flat three is just moving down one step. So you're going one, flat three, and then five is the same. And then seven needs to be flat seven. So I just bring it down one and then bang, I've got root. So I got one, flat three, five, flat seven, one. But like I said, I'm going to make a very detailed course on this because I know mm -hmm. how confusing and like it will very yeah, yeah. confuse you quite quickly. But my goal with the music theory course is I'm going to teach you cage shapes, but I'm going to teach you how to understand how to pick out where all the arpeggios are within the caged shapes, which is like the open chords. And you can move that around the fretboard. So they're movable shapes that are going to crush. And it's like, when I learned that and I understood how to actually apply it to my improvisation, it was just like, oh my God, I just became so much better as an improviser. Um, so that's that second part is learning how to connect to the chords. So whenever a G minor chord comes out, I know that it goes bom, 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 bom. That's not part of the G minor, but then I got a C minor. And then I know when it, why I'm staying in the menta, in the pentatonic, I'm not focusing on C minor, minor. I'm not focusing on the C minor arpeggio. I'm focusing on where does it fit in the pentatonic? Cause I don't want to do the extra work of like, I'm playing through arpeggios. I want to just know that. When I'm improvising in my pentatonic and I hear the chord come up, I can go to those notes to connect for that chord if I want to. So mm -hmm. if it lends towards me being more connecting to the chord, I will do it. But if I'm vibing on a rhythm and the rhythm is way more important and me just riffing on the pentatonic is way more important, I will stay there. This is not a like, you have to do every chord every time it changes. You just need to know that it is a tool that can be used and will sound great when used. And then with the D, um, this one in particular, this shape I'm playing here. So these notes are part of the pentatonic. Those are all part of the pentatonic, but this note here is not. So that's a natural seven, which is where that we get this really nice T, do, 
which is a really, really great pull in a minor key. Um, but that's a bit of like nerdy stuff. But so you're going to hear now, I'm going to do one where I just vibe. And then I'm going to do another round where I'll do it with connecting to the chords. And then I'm going to do one where I do both. So this is me just vibing. All right, now I'm going to connect to the chords. So did you hear the part where I went into the chords? Yeah. And then did you hear the part where I kind of just messed around and did whatever I wanted? No, so this will be, okay, so this will be, the, I'll do the part where, like this is me just messing around. And I'm gonna add, sometimes I'll hit the chords, sometimes I won't, I'll just do whatever I want. So we come in then. So you see there, that's going to set up me when I'm coming back to the, that I'm, I'm about to jump back into the G minor chord, but it's also like accenting other like major chord, but it, you can see that I'm just vibing at that point. And then I know that a C minor chord is going to come around and I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll go somewhere that fits there. And then I'm also like, if it just happens that my hand is ready, like I did a lick there that I went, like, did you hear me do yeah, that? Yeah. Part? That yeah. when in my mind I was vibing and I happened to just be there and I knew that chord was coming and I was like, I'm going to hit this chord. Bam. And then that's how I hit that chord. And that's why it popped off. It's not because I was like, all right, I need to lead myself all the way there. I focused on the groove way more. And that, did you hear how that solo vibed better than any of the other ones I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I wasn't thinking about what scale am I the playing? Scale. What chords am I playing? Yeah. I was vibing on the groove and then I was using the cues of the chords that were happening and me understanding that I know where the scale is. I don't need to know how to, I don't need to know how to do all that stuff. Like you'll see scale mm -hmm. exercise where they'll be like, a, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to do that stuff every day when I was younger and it was the complete waste of time. It completely wasted mm -hmm. my time. Like I, I lost hours in my learning because I did that because I didn't have someone who was good enough to tell me, Hey, you just need to know your scales and you need to play some music. And then if you, if you practice eight hours or 10 hours a day and eight hours of the day, you're playing music then you can sit down and practice scales for one hour and hone your craft on scales and really get that down. But that, that but that's only if you're doing another like, you know, four to four to eight hours a day of music. So if you're not doing that, then you never ever spend an hour on scales or exercises. Does that make sense? So yeah. I vibed harder and it sounded better because it felt better because I was connecting more to the music. I was connecting more to the groove. I was connecting more to the dynamics and being like that. And then once I had that down, I would then transition yeah. to being like, use my cues. I know, it's, I know the C minor is coming or right, I'm going to hit like the third on the C minor. And it just happened. Like I just happened to my hand. Like if you watch the replay, when we do that, you'll see that my hand just happened to be like moving that way anyway. And so I knew that I was moving that way. I was feeling that. And then I also was like aware of where my chords were. So like my ear is, is picking up on where everything's happening. So then I know that, oh, this is gonna sound sick. And then you hit it and you're like, nice. So like the experience is going to improve better and better. So like, that's the first step is like learning how to connect to groove, most important thing. Second step is learning how to fit chord tones over the scale that you're playing in. And then the third step is forgetting everything and going back to the, the feel yeah. and the groove of the song, but letting your ear move where it wants to. 
And if you can do that, like, three-step process and improvisation, like, it doesn't matter if you're playing, like, blues music or you're playing shred metal or whatever. The frameworks are still the same. That's how people write the most musical and beautiful solos. And if you're trying to connect with people, which is what most musicians want to do, that's the only way. Like, if you want to impress a musician, practice like six hours days of exercises so your hands move really, really fast, and they'll be like, man, I can't even do that. That's crazy. But if you want to, yeah. if you want to connect with someone, then you, you learn how yeah. to do that. And connecting with someone will satisfy you more, trust me, like in my experience, it just, it definitely fulfills you more when you know that what you've played has now connected with someone, they enjoyed it, they're inspired by it. And then the most important thing is um, you get paid for it. And if you get paid, like you get paid for it. Like if you do that, like you focus on that kind of playing in your, in your craft, like building up that skill set in your playing, you will get paid for it. And if you get paid for it, that means you now don't have to do another job to then play music. Because whatever you, whatever any musician thinks, you will always have to make money. And that's how the world is. So I would rather equip you with the skills that are gonna get you paid to just play. So maybe, you know, you will work like two nights a week. You'll work two nights a week playing music. And then maybe do like, a couple of afternoons of teaching you you could have essentially like live on 10 hours of work a week and it's like if i don't know if you want to ask your parents that ask them hey if i were to make my entire living and then save money and it only cost me 10 hours a week is that a good job and everyone will yeah. tell you that's the best job yeah <laughs> They're like you're crazy <laughs> like that that's not possible but it is it is possible, you know? And then if you want to go like to the craziest levels of it, then you will just copy exactly what I do, which is I'm building up a live streaming platform and I'm building an online community. And then all I do is I just go and play music every single day and I do whatever I want. And then if I deliver value to you guys, wicked. And I try to make it as valuable as possible, but I still try to stay true to what I'm trying to accomplish. And so I'm always getting better at music. And then eventually I'll get paid for it. So that's good. So yeah. Uh, uh, so and how do you record your guitar videos? Like they sound very clean. So the sounds coming through Ableton Live. Did you end up getting Ableton Live? Mic? No, I I don't use mic. I use an audio interface. So. Yeah. So I have I have an audio interface that goes into my computer, and in my computer, the digital working station, audio working station that I use, the door is Ableton Live. So that course, like, if you can be patient with me for a few weeks, just because I'm getting back into the groove since we've had our son, um, I will have a full creator course for you. I will show you exactly the equipment I use. You can go and buy the same mm -hmm. things um, or, or the cheapest version of what I, I would use. Um, mm -hmm. And then you just do exactly what I do. If you want to get the exact same results as me, I will show you exactly what I do. In fact, if you get Ableton Live, I will have my, I will set up an exact effect chain that I use, that you can use, that will be free. So you will, you will literally just have to pay to get Ableton. And then I will literally make a, a session. And then you guys just like copy and paste and it will work. So like, I will do that for you guys. That's what I'm going to try and do. So, and then like, I will show you how to use OBS and you will learn how to record the videos and sync up the audios and all that stuff. Like when I record videos, I just live stream. And while I'm live streaming, I'm recording everything. So I don't actually have to do any post-production. My post-production, I try to make it as efficient as possible because I, you know, I've got two kids, a wife, I work full time. Like me doing the content stuff is, that's my side hustle. I'm trying to build it up, but I've got to do that. And then I've, I've got my full-time work, like literally my, it's a Sunday and I've got like four messages sitting here and like three emails to go through um, for work because it's people inquiring about events and things like that. So I've got to like sort that stuff out. So I try to make it as efficient as possible. So I basically just go on, I go on OBS. OBS has my, my door plugged into it and my video 
and then I just push record and then everything's all set up. And then as soon as I finish the, the stream, I just take that recording and I just cut it up and then that's what I post. And so I will show you guys exactly how to make it very, very effective. But if, if that's the path that you're on, like just based on the videos I've seen you play and all those things, your number one priority, like truly any root, it's, it's any root, right? Am yeah. I pronouncing it right? Okay, cool. I had a friend in, yeah. in high school who had the same name. So I was like, yeah, I got to try and make sure I remember it. Um, the only thing that you need to do for the next six months is be so bullish on rhythm. Um, I don't know if you saw the video that I was telling you um, on one of the Feedback Fridays, but talking about like sing yeah, the yeah. melody and then play it, sing the melody and play it. And you need to learn to hear everything in time. The first level of ear training that um, everyone needs to develop is hearing rhythm and knowing that they're in time. Like being able to pick out notes and stuff, that's great. But rhythm is the most important thing. If you can hear rhythm and pick that out in your playing and you can be super locked in and just get really, really consistent with it, um, you're, you're just gonna watch how that just changes all of your playing and it's gonna make you really, really good in, in any setting you're in. Because you pair a great rhythm with a G chord, a C chord and a D chord, you can play in any band. <laughs> That's how wild it is. It's like, it's very simple like that, but that's essentially what I would, I would very much stress for you to, to focus on because that is, that is your biggest Achilles heel. You don't need to know the fretboard. You don't need to know all the scales. You don't need to know anything. You just need to know how to play insanely good in time. And I would okay. recommend that when you're playing in time, like when you're training it, don't get, I mean, you can have a metronome if you want to, but I would get the song that you're playing to play to the song learn to copy the song and make sure your recording self you want to record yourself while you're playing to the song so you can hear whether you're in time or you're out of time and that's that's what's going to make you crush because you're going to you're going to build up really solid rhythm and timing but on top of that it's going to be like it's going to be like all musically oriented and you'll be learning new songs that are important. Like say if you picked up Brown Eyed Girl and then, you know, you put picked up the recording and then it has like, da 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 You could learn that if you want to, but the main goal would be like, da 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 Like you would just be playing the guitars. Like that is the most underrated guitar stuff, but that is the stuff that will get you paid. It will get you in the room with people. It will get you playing more and it will, it will truly just make your skills as a player more and more exceptional. I just dropped my guitar, picking my guitar, damn it. Um, but yeah, does that, does that give you a good, good starting point from here? You're nodding out and like, yeah, we're vibing. Yeah, actually, there were background noises. That's why I was like, sorry. What was that? Sorry. Yeah. I think you cut out. Oh, you, I think you muted yourself. Yeah, actually. So, what I wanted to ask you is. Uh, so in order to join Berkeley College of Music, do I also need to be good in academics? So will that also help for the scholarship or it's yes. just based on my skills? Yes. Anything that you can do to show Berkeley you are a hardworking person is what matters. So that means you're not someone who is lazy at school. You're not someone who's lazy on your instrument. You present well you try hard, things like that, though any single thing will help you. And I'm not saying like go and get like A pluses on everything. You don't need perfect grades. But if you show that, hey, I can I can get an A, I, you know, and like getting A's at school is actually a lot easier than a lot of people think. 
because most schools will say, here's the criteria of everything you need to do. And then you just do that. Don't do anything more. Don't try and go above and beyond. Just do whatever they ask in the criteria and crush it and then move on. And like, when you say, uh, yeah. when you say, I want to go to Berkeley, right? Yeah. When you say that, you're essentially saying, I want a scholarship to the best music college in the world where some of the greatest musicians have gone and I want to be in that space. Now, when you say that, there's a level of work that exists to get there. And so when you say that, depending on what your, your level of your player, like right now, you're more of an intermediate player and there's going to be a lot of work to do. When I tried to practice for Berkeley, I was doing like three to six hours a day of practice. And I tried and I tried and I tried. And that is what you would have to do for years to catch up. Yeah. And when you were in high school, how did you manage both studies and playing music? Like, could you I, manage both? I would practice guitar in the morning afternoon i wouldn't go I, like during lunch breaks i would eat and i would practice in the guitar in the music room i used to miss some class to go and practice that's what i used to do uh, so uh, uh, so were you a good student too like in academics too you were good or is uh, it like when i went to high school i i i did a do you know international baccalaureate it's like an IB high school and they call international baccalaureate. It's internationally accredited, like grading. I did that. I got like four A's and two B's. So I was pretty good. Like one of the A's was in music. So that's a win. <laughs> but, um, one, and like, that was a, I was like, it was a good score, but where I was able to show Berkeley is when I, I went to a conservatory for music before I went to Berkeley. Cause I didn't know about Berkeley. I'd never heard of it. After one year of being at the conservatory, I wanted to quit. And then I discovered John Mayer and then he did a lecture at Berkeley. And then I watched that lecture and I was like, Oh my God, I want to go here. I want to be like this guy. And so I was like, well, if he went to Berkeley and he said, he, you need to learn from Pat Patterson, I'm going to go to Berkeley and I'm going to learn from Pat Patterson. And that was the only reason I was going to Berkeley. I was like, John Mayer said to go, I'm going to, well, John Mayer went, so I'm going to go. I, I didn't know how to figure it out on my own. I didn't have anyone who could show me, anyone who could guide me or give me the skills. Like you truly don't have to go to Berkeley if you don't want to, I will give you all the skills. But if you want to go to Berkeley, cause you want to be like, I want to be around the best musicians and I want to see what I can do, then definitely go to Berkeley. But um, for me, that's what happened. And then while I was at uni, like that first year and a half, so before my first audition, I was like C's and B's. And then I, they said, yeah, your grades matter. We want to know that you're a good student. Literally, you could see it on the transcript. So when I showed, when I went for my third audition, I said to him, I was like, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but we did an audition like two years ago. And um, yeah, I just want to let you know, I really took what you said to heart. You guys want to see good students for getting scholarships. So um, I fixed my grades and then for them, I went from being, you know, C's and B's, every single subject was an A. So like on a GPA scale for America, I went from like a 2.9 or whatever to 4.0 on everything, which is perfect grades. So that's what I did. And I put a lot of effort into it. So I, I did the music practice, I did all that stuff and I had the perfect grades. So then they were like, this is a no brainer. That's how me as being someone who wasn't exceptional, I wasn't like my roommate got the same scholarship as me, but my roommate is like one of the best piano players in the world. Like easily one of the best classical piano players in the world. He's a fucking beat. He is so good. Uh, what is name? <laughs> his name is, his name's Tony Ann. Tony? What? T Tony Ann. Okay. Yeah, he's like one of the best classical players in the world. And um, and I got a very similar scholarship to him. And I'm not exceptional. I was just someone who showed promise. So going back to that, 
what they said in the the application process shows promise. But right now you're looking at something that's like so far away. Like you're about like two two years away to doing this. So all you need to do is like, all right, if I'm gonna go do that, I'm gonna do the next right thing. For you, it's like don't do distraction distraction. Learn how to practice like two or three hours a day. If you could do two or three hours a day every single day for yourself right now. By the time you're 18, you're going to be really, really good. And if you're posting on Feedback Friday, every Friday, you're going to get so good. It's just not even funny. Can you Have you seen the improvement that you've done in the past three weeks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah have, I other can people, see have other people noticed the improvement? The people, uh, like people no, actually, play with. People I play with. Uh, Actually, I don't have any band. Just it's just me and a keyboard uh, and a guy who plays piano keyboard. That's Does it. he notice you improving? Keyboard. Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, you're improving. This sounds better." Yeah. You just need to do that every day. Yeah. There's no magic formula. Like if you just do that every single day, and every time mm -hmm. you hit a new stage, you'd be like, "Luan, what's the next step?" And I'd be like, "Here's the next step. I will give you every mm -hmm. single next step till you become." better than me a guitar like that's i can do that for you it's no problem that's that's what our community is for so so do you so there you go we, we've got the framework for how to get to berkeley it doesn't matter right now but you just need to know you got to take those like two little steps each time and then all we need to do is work on our rhythm playing and crush it and then you're going to win I can't hear you. Is somebody there? Is somebody talking to you? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was no, hearing. Don't be you. sorry. Is that your family member? Yeah. Oh, say hi. Say Luan from Australia says hi. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. Actually, he's my brother, and he's gone. That's so cool. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm gonna have to pack up and get ready to go, but. I yeah. hope that helps. So for the next next few weeks, I want you to be bullish on rhythm. So these posts that you yeah. do in Feedback Friday, if you can just yeah. post videos of you being like, okay, well, I went through Luan's song list and I'm learning the rhythm mm -hmm. of this song or I'm learning the rhythm of this song and then you try and play those songs and then we we will give you feedback on how close you get. You do that for the next uh, three weeks? I yeah. promise you can do well. Uh, should I focus more on covers or should I focus more on improvising? Covers, hundred percent. Yes, you need you need to learn how to play music. Like, uh, should it be solo or just uh, playing the chords? Playing the chords of pop songs. Okay. Yeah, because remember, um, pop songs, the rhythm of a pop song, is the rhythm of a song that has influenced many people, and is very successful. So if you just yeah. learn hundreds of successful rhythms, you're going to be a very mm -hmm. successful rhythm player. You know, just like one plus one equals two kind of thing. And then when you go to, like, don't not improvise. I would totally improvise, but I would make sure you still practice. So play the music and then do improvise. Play the music, improvise. And then you'll just find that your improvisation is just going to get better because <laughs> you're playing music. You're hearing more music. You're learning more music. So like you could just do it one song every day, learn a new song every day and have fun. Like Google the chords. Oh, this is how you play a Foo Fighters song. This is how you play Brown Eyed Girl. This is how you play John Mayer's Slow Dancing in a Burning Room. You would just like go and look at all these different songs, as many songs as you can. Yeah. And at the beginning, you're going to suck at it. But every song that you try and learn, the next time you go to the next song, it will be better. And then you'll go back to those songs and it will sound better. There's a, I'm going to post another video as well. My wife was like, dude, you should post the before and after. That was, yeah. I'm going to go back. There's a video of me in like December trying to sing Dive by Ed Sheeran. And it was so bad. So bad. Yeah. And then last week I sang Dive and it was actually quite good. So you're going to okay, see. You mean I just sing and upload? What was that? Uh, you mean, should I sing and upload? Like, I mean, I should sing and play guitar both. No, no, no. I'm saying for me. So for me, okay. I sang one song and it was bad in December. And I sang the same song mm -hmm. again now. 
and it's good. And so I didn't practice that song every day for nine months. I just played it maybe like 20 times in total. But because I was practicing mm -hmm. so many other songs, I was always getting better. So when I came back to that song every time, I was a bit better. So then when I finally sang that song, it was quite good. So that's what I mean to say. You don't need to master a song. You just need to like do many songs. And that's what mastering music is. Playing so many songs, you get more context, then you can do that. Um, then your context of so many songs is gonna make you so much better. But uh, I better turn it off. But dude, great job. And I hope this call helped you because um, that's what yeah. it's all about. And um, yeah. I will post this on YouTube, hopefully. And then you can watch it whenever you want. Sure. Perfect. All right, man. You're amazing. And thank you so much. Yeah. And I just realized yeah, your, you. your jacket says, hey, let's go. Yeah. yeah, my name. Yeah, let's go. Very, very cool. All right, man. Well, you stay safe and I'll chat to you soon. Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right, thank no you. No problem. Bye.